Hello. Hi there. Um, I am, so let me just advance this. So I am Skulk. I work for Mozilla. And um, I'm one of the lead front-end developers today. I work on a couple of different projects for the last six months especially. I've been working on Gaia, which is the front-end layer for Firefox OS. So how many of you have heard of Firefox OS? Ah, cool. Quite a lot of you. Has any of you written anything for it? Um, played around with the OS? Submitted something to the App Store? <laughs> cool. All right. So, <laughs> so what is Firefox OS? <clears throat> so Firefox OS is, again, Mozilla going and disrupting the mobile industry. In essence, giving the mobile industry a huge atomic wedgie and saying, we had enough of this as web developers especially and um, as users. Um, we're putting the users first and we're giving web developers the platform to create mobile web apps that's as good and in some cases probably even better than native apps. So we're doing this by having created a complete mobile operating system um, that's completely open source. It's completely written on HTML5. The front end is. We have two other layers below that. The layer right below um, Gaia is Gecko, which is just Firefox as you know it. And below that, we've got the Gonk layer, which is a little Linux kernel, which is basically exactly the same one you'll find on Android devices. So other than that, it's HTML5, and then we've created a whole bunch of new web APIs to fill the gaps that currently exist um, with regards to web apps on native platforms. The cool thing about all these APIs, though, <coughs> is it's not proprietary. It's not only Firefox. They're all going through the standardization process at the W3C, and once each of these reach, reaches a level of standardization, it's open to any browser vendor to impl implement this, anybody to implement this on whatever stack they want to. Um, and it's also not just for mobile. So while all of these things I'm gonna talk about today will work on Firefox OS, these APIs where they make sense will work on desktop as well. And most of, if not all, everything that I'm talking about today currently works on Firefox for Android. So you can get it on Android right now as well. So a Firefox OS app is just a web app. It's just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The thing that sets it apart at the moment is the new web APIs, which kind of means like it's web apps with benefits. So <clears throat> how do you deploy, how do you get your app around? So there's three different ways to get apps. So the one is a hosted app. Then you have privileged packaged apps. So I'll talk a little bit more detail about each of these. And then you get a certified app. Now, a certified app is something that's written by Mozilla. It's really OS core type stuff. Or it will be something that is distributed by one of the OEM partners like Telefonica or Deutsche Telekom or whoever. So for us, we probably will never write one of these apps, but they're out there. So it gets full access to the device right up to the metal. A hosted app. <clears throat> so a hosted app is just a web app as we know today. It runs on your server. It's in your control. If, however, you have a web app that you want to deploy on, a, that you want to run on Firefox OS, and it's just static. Everything happens on the client side. You can actually use GitHub pages. It works brilliantly. Free hosting, stable environment, and um, there's some, a small other benefit there as well. If you need more, you can obviously go for a Roku, Google App Engine. So this is all options if you don't want to actually run your own server. Um, but with all of these, one of the nice benefits is we're using an upgrade path that's familiar to everyone. Nothing new about it. Um, you have your app, you make your changes, go through your normal build and whatever processes you do. Once you're done, you push it to your server. Next time the user opens the app, it's updated. So the one version, the last version is the only version thing applies. So also, you're able to install this directly from your own website. So if you choose not to go through a marketplace, for whatever reason that is, you don't have to. You have the tools available to you to allow users to install it directly from your own site. So package app then. A packaged app is one that is hosted on the marketplace, Mozilla Marketplace servers. Um, and one of the things about it is that the upgrades goes through there. So this takes on a different paradigm now. So instead of building and just pushing and it's updated, you have to package your app, which is just a zip, and you have to submit that to 
the marketplace. One of the things of the marketplace, though, when you do submit your app there, is that it goes through the review and the security process. So there's actually people looking at the code, there's actually certain limitations that's applied, there's also certain restrictions and there's security guidelines that you need to follow. Once all of this is passed and the reviewers are happy, um, it gets signed. So it gives your users a sort of a safety net. Sort of saying like, okay, so this code has been checked and it's all good, it's not gonna try and do all kinds of weird things, there's no malware in here or anything like that. Um, it provides a distribution channel if you go through the marketplace. And the marketplace, what's different about the Firefox marketplace to other marketplaces is it's content driven. It's also content search based. So you're not searching for an app name, you're searching for an app that provides a service. So if you want an app that's got something to do with soccer, you just search soccer and it'll list all the apps that can give you something like ESPN site or an app that lists matches or anything. So it's content driven. Um, then also in the developer hub, you're gonna get app statistics. So you'll be able to see, so think Google Analytics for your app. So you'll be able to see how people use it and how many people use it and all that kind of thing. And then we'll be also using, working on is error reporting. So basically if you use an application on the desktop and it crashes, you get a little window that pops up and says, well, something went wrong. Sorry about that. Just, you know, if you have some time, tell us what went wrong and send us a report. So that will be available to developers on the phone on and on desktop and it will be for JavaScript. So it'll tell you about your JavaScript errors and you'll also have a nice UI and all that to go with it. The other thing that implicitly gets added to your app when you go through the marketplace is a content security policy. So this is again one of the security um, things that we add. So that basically like this one tells you that any script you load needs to come from the same origin as your app. Um, you cannot have any flash or, or applets on it at all. Um, and your style sheets and stuff also needs to be loaded either from the same origin or this one's a little bit more flexible so it allows you to do inline stuff if you really have to. Now while this is implicit and is part of an app that goes on the marketplace, I, um, you can still use this even for hosted apps. So you know, you can put this in your manifest or you can send this as a, um, a header. So one of the other differences that we need to talk about about hosted apps and privileged apps is API access. So because hosted apps don't go through any review process, you just push it, somebody installs it and there they go, we have to be careful to not give them access to too many of the sensitive APIs. So hosted apps, has access to a huge array. So some of these like desktop notifications, FM radio, allowing you to build an interface to a radio and you know, tune the channels and turn the volume and save favorite stations and all that kind of thing. Uh, geolocation, that's already also in browsers. And then storage, so you can have offline apps. So your apps doesn't have to be connected to the internet all the time. You have access to app cache, local storage, index DB. So, and these are all the other APIs that's also available to you. Vibration, Open Web Apps, that's the one that allows you to install and manage your installed apps. Um, IndexedDB, as I said. Then Mouse Lock, which is really cool for people who want to develop games, so that mouse events doesn't get triggered and mess with your game. Ambient light sensors, web payments that I'll talk about in a little bit more. And then Battery Status API, which seems boring, but as Jim mentioned, if you don't check your battery, bad things might happen. So we have a Battery Status API as well. So privilege apps, like I said, they get access to more of the sensitive stuff. So device storage, so this is not app cache, this. this is actual storage on the device. So you get access to read and write to the SD card. You get access to the user's pictures, videos, music files, you can read, write, delete, manage them, all that. You get access to all of it. Access to the context API, so you can create contacts on the phone, import contacts from say Twitter or Facebook or whatever. Um, manage them, delete them, whatever you want to do. System XHR is also something that you get. So if you're using a hosted app and you want to do cross-origin, you've got to go via JSONP. If you try to do cross-origin calls without that, it'll be blocked. It won't go through. So System XHR gives you the ability to do cross-origin requests without having to worry about cores or without having to worry about having to use JSONP. So you do straight AJAX calls and they get routed through a core server, allowing you to do this. TCP sockets, if you want to write chat apps, that kind of thing, this gives you full access to sockets. You can open closed sockets as you need and as you want. 
and then browser API allowing you, allowing you to basically embed a whole browser in your app and control it programmatically. So here's one of the samples of the APIs, like the context API, just to show you how simple it is to use these things. So you create a new mask contact, you initialize with some data, a name and a telephone number, and you call save. That goes off and triggers saving it into the context, and it's going to either come back with a success or a error. So if it's a success, great, your contact's been added. If it's an error, it'll tell you what went wrong. Maybe the user decided, I don't want to allow your app to do this, and it cancels it, or maybe some network error happened. So you get proper, clear errors as to what went wrong, not just some cryptic thing. So the manifest, that's what describes to your users and to the app store, what is this? And this is how you install your apps. So the minimum you really need is just the name and the description. That's all that's mandatory. But of course, you're not gonna wanna just have that because if you install an app without, for example, filling in the developer bits, it's just gonna say author unknown and that's not gonna be very good for, um, no user's gonna install that. So what I have here is basically the minimum you wanna go with. You could probably drop the default local if you don't have different locals for your app. And then the other important thing is that this has to have a .web app extension and you have to serve that one with the content type application, web app, um, manifest JSON. So if you're running on GitHub pages, they'll already serve it properly. They've already added the type and you don't have to worry about it. But also it's very simple to do. It's just an add type in your Apache config or you just send it as a header. So if you want permissions, so if you have a privilege app, then you need to define your permissions and you need to define all of them that you want. So for example, in this, we're defining contacts. I mean, and you need to say it in your description, what are you gonna use it for? So when somebody reviews your app, they can say, okay, so he wants to use the context API and he wants it to use for this scenario. So let's see if that's actually what the app is doing. So you can't say I'm gonna use it for this and then use it for something else. You have gotta be clear about that. And then obviously you specify the type of access you need. For APIs that um, is implicitly available to everyone, you can still add it to your permissions, but you don't have to use the access property because Implicit, you get full access. So, but for the others, you need to specifically say what you need. Okay, <clears throat> so like I said, so for hosted apps and these things, you don't get all the privileges. And then there's something like cool, like a camera API, but like, only certified apps can use that. But there's a way around it. So there's web activities. Um, I guess a lot of you have heard of web intents. This is the same thing. It's just a counter proposal from Mozilla that we're calling web activities. The idea behind web activities is that other than the delegation of control, you don't need to care about anything. Everything else happens transparently, it's handled by the system. So you've got a whole bunch of activities that you can use currently. There's like configure stuff, um, access the dialer, you can't dial numbers yourself for obvious reasons, but you can push a number to the phone and the user just needs to press dial. Um, pick, this is a cool one, which allows you access to the camera, and, but it goes through. How this basically works is it asks the system which app, is there an app on here that can handle, that can give me camera access? And it prompts the user, do you want to do this? And if the user's okay with it, he can go through and complete the activity. And the result of that activity gets returned to your app. Okay, so, basically activity. Using a, using PIC to get an image. So you specify the type, the data that you're interested in, and then you, bind two listeners. Either you have a success or an error. If it's a success, you get the blob back and you can use that to do whatever. So you can convert your blob into an object um, URL and use that as the source for your image or you can share it. So, for example, you can combine activities. We have a share activity here. So you say, okay, I want to share something. Um, I have one thing that I want to share. It's an image that I want to share. And here is the image itself. So the system will go and say, okay, which applications on the OS has registered itself as an activity handler for share and specifically images. When it finds that, it'll tell the user, do you want to use this? And they can go ahead and finish it. Once it's done, it comes back to your app again and says this is what happened. Either returning a response or returning some type of object. Now, installing your app. So you've done all these things, you've got your app, you want to install it, but you don't want to go through the marketplace, you want to do it yourself. This is how simple it is. <clears throat> you literally call install, pass it, your manifest location where it's located, and it goes off. Ask the user, do you want to install this app? 
the user denies it, you get an on error callback saying user denied. If the user says, yeah, sure, and he installs it, cool, then you get an on success, and you can store, store a reference to, to the app object and use that internally. Maybe you store it in local cache and you can check it against your server for maybe you have a new version that you want to push to the user or anything like that. So let's do this. So let's see this in action. <coughs> So, let me just get this to fit. There we go. Okay, so here I've got my install file. So it does what I just spoke about. So we have our install function called there, and I pass it the manifest. If it's success, I store a reference to the app. Otherwise, I just alert out the error old school style. This is the page that I want to display when the user opens my app. And here's my manifest, just giving him the name, the description, then giving it the launch path. So it says, when you open this app, take the origin and then append this to the back. And that's what I want you to open. This is the version. This is just some developer information. So at least when the app's installed, it doesn't say unknown. And then in here is where the action's going to happen. So we want to get an image and then we want to share it. OK, so currently I've got an image container there and I've got a little link that initiates the activity. So in my onload, I just get get the button and add event list for a click, then I get the image container, and then I just have an image blob for us in the meantime that I can store my image into. So, um, very first thing we want to do is to initiate the pick activity. So, it's a new Moz activity. And so, so we want to give it the names. So, we want to tell what, what we want to do want to pick. And then we tell it the data that we're either sending or that we're interested in. And this, we're interested in images. So image of type ping, uh, image of type JPEG. And then just for good measure, we add the other possible extension for a JPEG. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So that's the activity that's going to go off and do its thing. So we need to check when it comes back. So we want to check on success. We have a function. OK. And so when the success comes back, if it was successful, then it means we got an image. So first thing we want to do is we want to create uh, so document, create element image, right? So we're creating an image element. And then we're saying, okay, seeing we have this, let's store our image blob. So this is the response that came back. Um, result is the data object, and blob will be the image. Cool. So with the blob, Let's first display the image. So we say image source equals window dot URL dot create object URL. And we just pass it the image blob. All right, there we go. So <clears throat> that'll take the blob, convert it to um, image URL, and set that as the source of the image. So that'll display it. Cool, but what we actually want to do is we want to share this thing. So <clears throat> We create another activity, just initiate another activity, I should say. So share new Moz activity. Cool. And so we want to tell it the name, which is share, and then our data. So first of all, we want to tell it how many, how many items we want to share. In this case, we only want to share one. Um, so the type. Oops, sorry, it's an array. So we're interested in, we want to share, we don't know what type necessarily we have. Do we have a ping? Do we have a JPEG? So we just say, you know, it's an image type. Um, and then blobs, we just pass it image blob, right? Which is our image that we got back. That'll go off and tell the user, hey, we want to share this thing. So select what channel you want to use to share it and share it. Right, so the only other thing we have to do 
is something might go wrong. So the user might say, no way, I don't want your app to get access to my pictures or anything, and I don't, or I don't want to share this thing, so whatever. So just for that, and then we just old school alert it. So alert, oh no. And then again, coming back, this, is the response coming back, contains an error object, and then name. We'll give you a useful name, like denied access all. Something kind of useful. Right, so that is all the code. Cool, so let's see that the Wi-Fi and all that works nicely, I hope. Um, where is it? There it is. Okay, so, cool. Uh, let me push it. Let's see. Seems I have Wi-Fi, so let's see. Come on. You can do it. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just saw it on that one. That's why I was checking. All right, let's, let's, let's try this again. Boom. So why did you switch to that? Okay. Let's try the push again. Come on. Yeah. All right, so let's try this out. So open Aurora, which is a little bit older than Lightly, but not really that old. And um, open a tool that I'll talk about a little bit more later. So it's the Firefox OS simulator. Let me start it up. Okay, so there's a little error console, and then here's the thing. So you open the browser, and we go to my install thingy. Let me just make sure it's the latest one, right? Install the app. So there you go, install useless app. And uh, it doesn't know the size, but at least it tells you you wrote it. So I install it. It says, cool, it's installed. So I could hit this link, right, using the Moz Open Web Apps API and just launch it straight from here. But um, let's go down here and just, like, do all this funky stuff. So there it is. And there it opens up. Boom. Open web app, running on Firefox OS. So I want to share an image. Okay, I do. So here you go, so share an image. Then also the users, okay, cool. So choose how you want, what, how you want to get your image. You want to use a wallpaper, a gallery, or the camera. Can't use the camera on the, on the desktop because it's not, um, there's a way to do that. I'll talk about that later. So take an image. How do you want to share it? Okay, I want to share it on Twitter. There you go, type your stuff in and tweet. I don't want to share this one though. What I want to do is I want to use the device. Right, so we've got a Unagi device. Um, it's what we use internally for testing at the moment. Um, so I installed the app a little bit earlier. I promise it's exactly the same code. There's no trickery involved here. Launch the app. Share an image. Come on. There we go. This time I'm going to use the camera. So, let me not take a picture of my finger. Boom. Okay. Comes back, asks me how do I want to share it. Okay, I want to use Twitter. Cool. And I've typed in, so I don't have to <laughs> type with this little. So I'm tweeting out awesome people at RubyConf, right? Okay, so tweet. Come on. Yeah. So let's see if it worked. <laughs> let's see if it worked. So close that. Uh, open up Twitter. The awesome people at RubyConf. Yeah, let's check out the pick. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. So that's the basic. So let's just run through. I have some time still. Still go. Looks like I'm good. All right. Um, so if you want to get into this, this is one of the first places you're going to want to stop by, right? So where did I, oh. You're going to want to go to the dev app. Okay, it's marketplace.mozilla.org forward slash developers. Don't worry, I'm sharing the slides, so all the links are there. It's got everything there. It's got sign-ups for newsletters, um, the IRC channels, the everything you need is there. Um, SDK and IDE, uh, the web is the SDK, and the IDE is whatever you want to use. You want to use Emacs? That's cool. You want to use VR? That's fine. You want to use Dreamweaver? That floats your boat? Go for it. 
<coughs> it's just the web, so whatever you want to use. Debugging. Right, back to the laptop. Okay, so who has used Firefox and the developer tools recently? Or is most of you Chrome guys? Chrome is awesome. But let me show you what you can do with Firefox these days. So I'm going to, so a lot of these tools are already in the released one, but let's just go, like, to the latest and greatest. So let's go to Nightly. Cool. So let me open, let me open that file picture. So that's like, yeah, that's boring. So inspect element. Ha. Ah. So we've got some serious tools going on there. Right, so this on the, these are the new tools. Um, and so you've got the web console, inspector, you've got a debugger, you've got a style editor, a profiler, a scratch pad, all kinds of stuff. So one of the cool things about the style editor is you can sit there and you say, mm, I don't have style share, okay, bend the new one. Cool, so we have an anchor. So, right, <clears throat> let's quickly do something here. So, uh, display, inline, lock, padding, um, let's give it background color. Let's make it hot pink. Yeah. And then the color of white. Sweet. Um, text decoration. I want to remove that. Yeah. Uh, font family. So, sensory. So the guys without feet. And then uh, give it a border radius, maybe like six pixels just because it's easy. And a box shadow, like one, one, two. I'm trying to really go fast here. Did I miss it? There you go. Okay, cool. So that looks a bit better. It's not great, but it looks a bit better. Right, what you can do is you can hit save. You can go main.css. Boom, that's saved into your project now. The other cool thing you can do is you can say on the Mac, command option M, and hey, we have a response of you, right? So you can check how your site would look in uh, various configurations. You can also rotate it, right? You can choose a different size. You can choose that kind of size, right? Rotate it back. And you can customize whatever shapes and sizes you want. That's just some of what Firefox gives you now, which is like really awesome. So let me go back there. So those are the dev developer tools. So besides your whatever ID you're using, this is where you can debug and you can pretty much do whatever you want. OS Simulator, you saw that a little bit earlier. So that's actually um, a B2G simulator running in an instance of Firefox shaped to the phone size and it's a bit close in terms of rendering. Um, so developer tools in that respect lack a little bit, so, but there's a lot of effort going into remoting our tools and enabling you to use it on the phone even. Some bootstrapping stuff. So Firefox OS Boilerplate is a nice place to start. It gives you a lot of samples, and you can base your off this Mortaris or something developed at, our, at Mozilla. It gives you a whole bunch of app stubs that you can easily create for gaming or for just apps or a tab interface or whatever. Then I did a little one called Gluten Free, and that's literally just the bare minimum you need to get started. And all of these, you can just go git clone, boom, and then that's your own app, and you can start from there and go. For the UI, we got the building blocks. On, on GitHub Open, there's a site called Building Firefox OS. That's not officially Mozilla. It's from the guys from Telefonica, but it's really good, and it's really nice if you want to quickly see all the common dialogues that we have available, all the common controls and the colors and all these things. So that's all there. Um, developer phones. Just heard yesterday, these ones are shipping the first week in April. You can pre-order them now. They ship from Spain, and they're going to cost about 150 euros. Um, <clears throat> so it's a fully-fledged Firefox OS developer phone. And you can use it for your main phone if you want to. Testing tools, just quickly running through them. So for JavaScript testing, you can do whatever you want to, but we use Mocha and Chai, which is a BDD, behavior-driven testing tools. For automated testing on the phone itself, we use something called Marionette, which is an open source implementation of the WebDriver standard. So 
the reason why we didn't use Selenium by itself is because it doesn't have a Firefox OS driver currently. And Marinette offers uh, support for touch events, um, more control over um, script execution, uh, integration with special powers, which is something that I don't have time to explain now, and then the ability to access the Chrome. One thing about this at the moment is that it's a Python client and you have to write your tests in Python. But <coughs> it's based on an open standard, so there's absolutely nothing that prevents the Ruby community from writing their own Ruby client for Marionette. In fact, there already exists a .NET one. So these are, this is Firefox OS, this is what it gives developers, these are all the tools and things you can use. So thank you very much and stay in touch. <laughs>